Uh, so there will be a, a project assignment uh, posted um, by sometime tonight. And what I plan to do is spend part of today uh, talking about uh, some material in support of that. Uh, it'll be a simple C program in a Unix environment. Uh, but to walk you through that, you'll need to go over a couple things like virtual machines uh, and sp uh, specifically VirtualBox, as well as some basics uh, for the C programming language. Let me do this. Uh, where did I put it? There we are. And so, oh, what? Okay. So the reading uh, by next week, uh, please uh, go through sections 2.1 to 2.3 uh, in the text. It doesn't seem right. Yeah, for page, uh, pages 55 to 74. And then on the blackboard, I've posted some resources. Uh, one's a tutorial video and a tutorial document. Uh, concerning the C programming language. And so let me ask, uh, who has programmed in C before? C++? Okay, a little bit. Uh, everyone else is what, Python, Java? Okay, so if you've done C, uh, well, you already know it, but if you've done C++ or Java, you should already be familiar with the syntax for the C programming language. But there are some other constructs uh, that are uh, quite different. So why don't we start with that? And to do so, I will come out of PowerPoint here, and we're going to bring up uh, our virtual machine hypervisor, uh, VirtualBox. Um, has anyone used a virtual machine before? Okay. Uh, and so VirtualBox is available for free. Uh, it was uh, developed, well, actually purchased by Sun Microsystems, and Sun Microsystems uh, further developed it. And it, uh, Sun was purchased uh, by Oracle uh, when it collapsed at the end of the, when the dot-com uh, bust occurred. And so when you run uh, VirtualBox, uh, it will pop up and look uh, something like this, whether you're on Windows, uh, Mac OS, uh, or on Unix. Question? Yes, you will, you will need to. And that'll be in the assignment, everything you need to do. Um, yes, question? I can't hear you. Um, you can, VMware. If you already have a license for it, then great. Uh, you're welcome to. And so VirtualBox isn't the only VM hypervisor out there. VMware, uh, their Fusion uh, brand product uh, is out there. Parallels is a Mac uh, OS specific product. So you don't have to use VirtualBox, uh, but I will talk a little about VirtualBox specifically because I don't expect you to, to pay for uh, virtual machine software. Um, and I will comment, I see a lot of Macs here in the classroom. I will comment a little bit about settings uh, on Mac OS specifically because there's an issue as it pertains to the way uh, the graphics is handled uh, on Mac OS. So to answer your question, you will have to download it and also uh, you don't have to use VirtualBox, but I can't support, uh, you know, if there are questions about how Fusion or how Parallels work works. Okay? All right. Any other questions? No. So here's VirtualBox and uh, a virtual machine hypervisor is just a program, piece of software. Uh, in this particular case, it's uh, running as a user process, and it mimics or emulates uh, a processor, and as such, uh, or rather a whole machine, and as such, you can install an operating system on it. Now, certainly, uh, this isn't the only way to have a virtual uh, machine hypervisor, which is what the software is called that does this. Uh, you can also have one embedded in your operating system kernel running in privileged mode. And as such, uh, of course, it has uh, more access uh, to all the various parts of the underlying machine, but also it's a little bit more efficient uh, in terms of the speed. And then lastly, there's a type of virtual machine hypervisor where the hypervisor is the operating system, right? And so you would install this thing directly onto your machine, and then uh, when your machine boots, it boots into the hypervisor menu, and then you're running these virtual machine instances uh, directly from uh, your boot menu. Okay, uh, so in this particular case, we're dealing with a hypervisor that's user uh, software. So there's also um, a way to take a machine specification, 
So you can think of uh, von Neumann uh, machine or architecture as consisting of all the parts that we talked about. It has CPU, it has RAM, it has a kind of bus, it has I.O. controllers, and there are I.O. devices attached uh, to that I.O. controller. Uh, now, all of this in simulation, uh, the neat part is that you can now save it, right? Uh, and so uh, if you wanted to package up an environment uh, to allow people to run things uh, for something like a class or maybe it's a, a work scenario, you can now say, okay, well, load this uh, serialized or virtual machine description or state that has been uh, written out to disk. Moreover, while this uh, virtualized machine is running, you can also save it or create a snapshot, right? So let's say, you know, you're doing research in security and um, you know you're going to be visiting some websites uh, that could potentially infect your machine. Well, why not do that from a virtual machine? Because if you infect it, then you can go back to that snapshot or that uh, written out state that reflects uh, the state of your machine at a particular uh, point in time. Okay? All right. So when you start uh, a virtual uh, machine instance, you're going to say new in something like virtual box. And one of the things it needs to know is what type of operating system you're going to use or install on this virtual machine instance. So you give it a name, uh, some name, and you choose whatever name you want. Uh, you have to give it a path uh, where it's going to store this machine. And this machine is also going to have a simulated hard drive. Now, that simulated hard drive we'll see in a few steps. There are two ways you can, re can create this. Uh, one way uh, will be slightly slower in terms of performance, uh, but it'll take much less disk space. And I'll describe uh, in particular more about that in a, in a few moments. Uh, but the other is to specify uh, the type of operating system product uh, you're going to have, right? So, you know, you, they have the major ones, Linux, Microsoft Windows, uh, Mac OS, and so forth. So, yes, you could install Mac OS uh, on a virtual machine instance, regardless of what the underlying machine is running uh, for the so-called host uh, operating system. And so in my case, I'm running uh, Mac OS. Uh, so that's the native uh, operating system for my machine. That's the host. And then every virtual machine instance running some operating system installed on those virtualized um, instances, those are the so-called guest operating systems. So you can have Windows, Guest, you can have all the major operating systems, Solaris, which is Sun Microsystems, a version of Unix, Berkeley Systems Division, or BSD, uh, and so forth, right? You're all too young to remember. Anyone know o OS2? No? Okay, you're all too young to remember OS2. Um, I'll talk about the history at another time. Uh, it was quite interesting. I loved OS2, but anyways. Um, so you'd select the type of uh, machine that you want to uh, install, and this affects uh, the layout of the disk, because when you uh, set up your hard drive in order to boot the operating system, it's very specific depending on the type of uh, operating system you choose. So I'm going to choose Linux, and uh, the version of my virtual machine, you notice uh, you can choose all sorts of uh, word sizes. So the two, it's, it gives you choices between is 32-bit and 64-bit. So let's say you have some legacy software you want to support, um, or if you have a 32-bit machine and you want to virtualize a 64-bit installation, it, you're going to realize a slowdown, but it'll, uh, w it will work. And so then you select uh, your particular uh, distribution. So let's say I want to simulate Ubuntu 64-bit. Uh, I would select that. Okay. So I hit continue, and now it's going to ask me uh, how big should this virtualized uh, or simulated uh, RAM be. Now, of course, you can only have as much RAM simulated as you have physical RAM on uh, the host uh, operating system, available to your host operating system. And so I have 16 uh, gig of RAM on this machine, and I could, if I chose to, allocate all 16 gig, or 16,000 roughly meg, uh, of RAM to this virtual machine instance. Now, when you do that, you want to be very careful, right? Because the virtualized memory that your virtual machine takes is going to carve that out of the available uh, RAM on your uh, host machine, right? And so if you have 16 uh, gig of RAM and you give it 15 of those 16 gigs, uh, well, everything else on your machine is going to run doggedly slow when that virtualized instance is running. So I usually like to give it, you know, roughly about half, maybe six uh, gig or eight gig uh, when I'm running it. All right. So let me just, for this particular example, I'm just going to give it one gig of RAM or 1024 meg, and I'm going to continue. So it's going to ask you about the memory. So this is where the hard drive uh, is concerned. Now, of course, you want to create a hard drive in this instance, right, in your instance. Uh, and it says create a virtual hard disk now, right? So you can create a new one or you can attach it to an existing hard drive if you have this virtual 
hard drive sitting around as a file somewhere on disk. So I'm going to say, all right, go ahead and create that. And now it's going to ask you for the file type. I usually just take the, uh, the default, uh, a VDI file. And you don't need to know too much about it, uh, but just for the sake of this class, uh, just uh, select the, uh, the default, which is the VDI virtual uh, box disk image. So if we continue, now these are the two ways you can allocate uh, your hard drive, your virtualized hard drive, on this virtual machine instance. One is dynamically allocated, and the other is a fixed size. Now, if you make it a fixed size, uh, and then you say select uh, a hard drive size, a virtualized hard drive of, say, 20 gig or 30 gig, when it's fixed size, it's going to go ahead and allocate that space ahead of time. So that means um, you're going to get a 30 gig virtualized hard drive. Now, where does it get that space? It gets it from your existing hard drive on your host machine. And so if I have only you know, 10 gig left, and I say create a 30 gig uh, fixed size hard drive, it's not going to work, right? Because it's going to want to grab 30 gigs of the existing disk space associated with the underlying host machine. So uh, a better way to do that is dynamically allocated. Now what dynamically allocated, as the name implies, is that it makes that hard drive file bigger uh, as time goes on, as you store more and more stuff on that virtual machine's uh, simulated hard drive. Uh, that's a little bit slower than fixed size because if it's pre-allocated ahead of time, you don't need to do that work of growing it every single time uh, you exceed uh, the uh, underlying disk size. Okay, uh, So I'm going to accept the default. And so know that if you say fixed size, also the consequence is that your virtualized machine instance, if you tried to save it, is going to take longer to save, and that instance uh, is going to be much, much bigger because it's going to include all the other pieces of your virtual machine saved on disk, but also that full 30 gig if you allocated a 30 gig hard drive for it. Uh, so please be careful with that. Uh, I like to use dynamically allocated. You're welcome to use whichever setting you want, uh, but there's a consequence based on uh, what setting you choose uh, for the way your hard drive uh, is allocated. Right. Any questions about this? Okay. So let's continue. And now uh, we create uh, the disk itself, and it asks you what the size is you'd like to make it. Now, of course, this is carved out of the available hard drive space on your system. So, you know, I have, uh, well, this is, I don't have two terabytes. I know that. That's weird. All right. So if you, it's carved out of your underlying hard drive. And because I said dynamically allocated, right, um, I can specify two terabytes, even though this machine only has 250 gig, right? And because it's dynamically allocated, it allows me to do that. And it'll keep growing and growing and growing as I save more stuff. And then, uh-oh. I'm going to run out of space on the physical drive because I only have 250 gig, whereas the simula simulated machine uh, can dynamically grow up to uh, two terabytes. Right? So you want to um, tread lightly here, and you know usually a few tens of um, of gig uh, works. I like to do maybe 10, 20 gig if it's a really big uh, application I'm running, like dealing with a lot of data. Um, maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger, but I generally usually don't make it any more than you know. 10% of the available hard drive space. In this case, I have 250 gigs, so I'd make it no more than 20, 25 uh, gig. Okay? All right. So let's just choose a value here uh, just to walk you through this. Uh, and I hit create. And now all of a sudden, I have a new entry here. And this entry uh, corresponds to this virtual machine instance I just made. So if I double click on this, right, it's going to pretend or act uh, like I booted a machine. And now I remember, you know, when I was a kid and you bought a computer, uh, the operating system uh, came on uh, some disks. And when you booted this machine, plugged it in, turned it on, put it in the monitor and all that stuff and turned it on, it would come up and boot with no operating system. You actually see that boot sequence and it would say, this is not a startup disk. You need to insert your operating system installation, right? And that's the state that these things have. Typically, when you buy a machine now, it comes pre-installed with the operating system. So you're not used to seeing that, uh, but you could absolutely do that, get the installation media, uh, DVD, press out an ISO, what have you, and, and do that yourself. So I'm going to try to power this on. And what you'll see, um, it'll ask me uh, for a disk, right? It's assuming that I have some installation disk uh, available uh, whether that's an actual disk, I might put a DVD, attach it to the machine, and point the installation, uh, the boot at that. 
or uh, uh, what's called an ISO uh, file. An ISO is nothing more than an image. You could think of it as a bootable uh, DVD that sits as a file on your desk, and you can point this thing to the ISO as well. Now, when you install things like Ubuntu Linux, um, and you know, choose the distribution that you like, uh, one of the things you'll do, it's available for free, and you can download the ISO file. Now, you could either choose to uh, download the IS ISO file and then point this, uh, this boot of the virtual machine at that ISO file, and it'll start to load it and install as if you were inserting a DVD. Or you could actually burn a DVD from this ISO, uh, and there are standard file programs on most operating systems that'll do that. And then once you burn this DVD, you can now carry it with you and then insert it and uh, uh, go through the install process. So I'm just going to boot uh, the empty uh, machine. Nope. Uh, what has happened here? Creating a process for row. Okay. All right. It didn't need to tell me that. All right. So actually, it doesn't allow me to do that. Okay. Very well. So it doesn't allow you to do. Oh, there it is. It's running. Okay. So this is my sum name. A virtual machine instance it's running and it pops up inside of a window let me change it to scale mode and in scale mode uh, as you resize the window so too does the virtual machine instance uh, underlying it so let me blow that up and it says fatal no no bootable medium found uh, so that means uh, the floppy the hard drive in this simulated machine it doesn't have an operating system bootloader installed on track zero. So that first track on the outside of the platter, track zero, and that's where the system looks uh, to run some startup program, right? That startup program is something called the bootloader, and it's the bootloader's job to then find the operating system and start executing that, right? Okay, any questions about this? No, makes sense? All right, so I, uh, the book provides, you can save the machine, or you can power off the machine and do all sorts of uh, stuff. So let me just power off the machine, uh, simulated power off, and now I'm back. Uh, so I went ahead, and there's something called an OVA file. That's uh, a description of an installed virtual machine uh, that has been saved uh, in the off state uh, on disk. And so when you create a virtual machine instance, uh, you can actually import these so-called OVA files, and that's what you'll be doing using the one provided by uh, the book's uh, main book's author, and uh, that'll get you right into a virtual machine instance, and the only thing uh, left to do is to change the settings. So let's take a look at the settings uh, for this uh, virtual machine uh, that I created uh, by just importing the OVA file provided uh, by the textbook author. So when you bring up settings, it's going to show you, uh, let me see if I can blow that up. This doesn't allow me Oh, yes, it does. It doesn't change the font. Okay. So hopefully you can see this in the back. Uh, so, of course, you know, the machine has a name, and it has a type, and it has a version. Okay, great. Um, so the system, right, you can actually change things like the amount of simulated memory. So you can actually, you know, it's kind of like taking your machine, you know, turning it off, opening it up, and going in and adding uh, to the RAM, right? Uh, you can do that uh, with this virtual machine instance. Uh, if you go into settings and select uh, system, and you can, you know, move the slider up or down uh, to change the amount of RAM uh, that is allocated to this virtual machine instance. And I like to, you know, take no more than half because I still want the rest of my machine um, running natively on the host operating system to run relatively smoothly. Because if you deprive it of too much memory, then, you know, things are going to be really slow because it's uh, making greater use of uh, the so-called swap space, that special area of hard drive where it puts pieces of programs uh, when it can't, when they can't fit in memory. Okay, so you can specify the type of pointing device, uh, and I uh, like to use PS2 mouse. Uh, PS2 uh, historically is from the IBM PS2. It's your typical mouse uh, that would be optical or have a ball and the two buttons, so it's a two-button mouse. But there are other types of touchpad, trackpad types of simulated uh, pointing devices that you can have. Uh, and so you can also specify the boot order when you first boot up your machine, the order in which it will look at various storage devices looking for um, the bootloader to run your operating system. The processor, you can specify um, more than one CPU, right, a multiprocessor system, and 
when you have a machine and you have more than one core in your machine, uh, this CPU setting in the virtualized instance maps directly uh, to the number of cores you have. And so if I were to specify six CPUs, it's now going to spread processes uh, for this virtualized instances onto each one of those six cores, or rather, if I have a six core machine, it's going to spread these virtual CPUs onto each of these cores. And so you also want to be careful because if you deprive your system of the use of too many cores, uh, you're going to get much slower performance uh, from your rest of your system when you run this VM instance. And so all of the resources that you specify for the virtualized instance are going to be carved or out of or allocated uh, from all of the resources that you have associated with your host operating system. Okay. Uh, any questions about this? Make sense? Okay, so this execution cap, one thing you can do is say, okay, for each one of these CPUs that I allocate, I can enforce the fact that it uses no more than a certain uh, percentage of that CPU's time. And so if I chose to, I could set the execution cap to, to say 25%, but give it all six cores, access to all six cores. Or you could choose to give it exclusive access 100% to a smaller number of cores. So please, um, when you look at this, uh, look at how many cores your machine has available and then uh, go from there. Uh, in Windows, it's easy enough to do it with your control panel. In Mac OS, if you go to, um, oh, where was it? The control, no, option. If you hold down the option key uh, and the Apple menu changes to system information, you click on system inf information and it'll tell you what processor you have. And uh, where was it, where was it, where was it? If you search for that processor, uh, Intel Core i7 uh, online, you can find out how many cores you have based on the type. There's some way in here where, where it specifies that. I think uh, I can show you a way underlying in the command line to, to get that. Okay, so that's the memory. And of course, the display, um, this is specific to Mac OS users, right? If you're going to use the most current version of uh, VirtualBox, um, because of the way the graphics are done when it changed to Mojave, uh, which is the current version, uh, which I believe is uh, uh, 10.14, Mac OS 10.14, um, the graphics changed uh, to use something called Metal GPU Acceleration. And uh, so VirtualBox has not caught up yet. And so for the current version, which is 6.0.x, right um it's going to be very very slow for basic things like drawing and uh shifting windows around inside of a windowing environment and so the way you get that uh to work and it took a lot of uh background uh, uh investigation uh if you set your graphics to controller to vm svga uh vga stands for video graphics uh i forgot what the a stands for but vm stands for virtual machine and s stands for super so you're using um Super VGA uh, display technology, and that boils down to the resolution uh, that you can uh, uh, show how many pixels on the screen, uh, but you're using the VM version. There are other versions you can use. Uh, you can use VBOX v, uh, VGA uh, or VBOX uh, SVGA, but you need to use VM SVGA to get past this display issue. And then you also turn on uh, 3D acceleration, right? Um, this is specific to Mac OS on others, um, specifically Windows and Linux, it'll run a lot more cleanly uh, out of the box without having to uh, make these settings. Okay, uh, any questions about this? All right. Uh, so, of course, there are other things. I won't go over all of these. Uh, you can look at the storage. It'll tell you um, various things about um, DVDs that have been associated with it. Uh, there's a so-called guest editions. Uh, when you first install VirtualBox, uh, one of the things you can install is the guest editions, and the guest editions give you the ability uh, to rescale the screen, and it also makes your graphics a little bit better, right? Uh, and so that's something when you first install it, uh, there's a menu choice in your VirtualBox menu, uh, and it'll say install uh, or mount or associate the guest edition CD if you search through the menu choices. Okay, uh, guest editions aren't required, but it just makes the experience uh, a little bit easier, and your machine, uh, you'll find, runs a bit better. Okay, and so you can do all sorts of stuff with audio and then also network. Now network um, uses something called NAT or network address translation. And what this NAT is, it's a way of uh, multiplexing, or uh, if you will, or uh, sharing uh, one um, network uh, uh, 
gateway or a router uh, among a bunch of different devices. And typically in physical world, when you have a NAT device or network address, uh, address translation. Uh, so when you have uh, internet at home, uh, you typically have more than one device, uh, uh, and but you only have a single router uh, that uh, connects you to the internet service provider, right? And so you might wonder, gosh, well, how can I get all those devices connected? Uh, network address tr address translation is the technology uh, by which you do that. And so if you want details about it, I would Google search it. Certainly next semester, take computer networking, and we talk about the plug and play uh, protocol uh, in uh, more detail. But since this is operating systems, we won't talk about that. I know some of you have taken networking with me. All right. Uh, so what else? There's things like ports and shared folders and user interface. We won't uh, talk much about those. So let's get to the business at hand. Let's just start this virtual machine and see what it looks like. And so when it runs, uh, if you're not familiar with Ubuntu, uh, it is has a graphical user interface. So you get a boot menu. That's Grub, the bootloader. We select Ubuntu, and then you see all the initialized stuff that you'd usually see with a typical Linux installation. It's starting various uh, processes called daemons that sit in the background and give you things like your file system and also give you things uh, like your I.O. controllers and all that other stuff. And so you'll see it has a graphical uh, user uh, desktop. And like any graphical user desktop, you can change uh, the image that's displayed for the banner for the background. Uh, you know, maybe there's a favorite picture you like, what have you. You can change the colors and all that good stuff, right? And so it is, exact, is exactly uh, how it would look uh, if it were um, a, a physical machine installation. And so it starts out, it has a single account. OSC stands for Operating System Concepts. And the password is OSC, Operating Systems Concepts. And you can change uh, the password. And you can also um, uh, add new accounts if you want to. Uh, but there's a single administrative, a single account that also uh, has administrative uh, privileges. So let me type the password, which is OSC. Uh, and it boots into a graphical desktop. Uh, and it's a little bit slower than if you ran natively, but it still you know, does a halfway decent job. Now, here you'll see graphical desktop, right? And you can switch the mouse from being uh, an input device in your local machine, your uh, host machine, or to your guest machine, in this case, uh, the Ubuntu uh, desktop running in the virtualized instance. And so uh, let me go over here. I can search for a program terminal or text editor and you'll see here it has a little bit of a funky lag and that's because of a graphics issue on Mac OS right so let me go back here and let me delete that terminal there we go and if I run that terminal uh, another way to do it is by hitting option T. Everything has what are called hotkeys. They're key com keystroke combinations uh, that you can use to quickly get at things instead of having to search or type names. Now, I'm just going to run this. So let me click on terminal. And you, oops, why is that on? So now I'm getting a phone alert. It's probably my wife saying, oh my gosh, you did see that. So um, why did that sound turn on? I apologize for that. So um, when I click on terminal, we get this command line interface, right, or CLI. And that's one way you input things uh, into your computer. And what a command line interface does, and we'll learn about this a little bit more, and that's fact, uh, that's one of the things uh, that I'll be talking about. Uh, it's how you input things into your operating system, one of the ways. Uh, when you have these icons, a so-called uh, WIMP interface, window icon menu pointer, a graphical user interface, has those four components. Um, when you double click on an icon, all it's doing is launching an application. Well, the CLI or command line interface does so similarly, but it waits uh, for your command, right? So if I typed terminal and this ampersand means run it in the background. Um, nope, oh, come on, which term? All right, so I can type commands uh, on the command line and hit enter. And when I do that, it'll input this command and do something. So clear, clears the screen. LS stands for long uh, for listing, list all of the files in the current directory. Uh, I can 
uh, ask for help. Uh, there's something called the manual pages in Linux, and the manual pages are a kind of help documentation associated uh, with each uh, command. So if I type man for manual, ls, enter, uh, a list of the directory contents. And it shows you what the command is, what it does, and the fact that it has a number of so-called options. So you type ls, space, and you have a bunch of optional options that you can specify. And the options uh, description is typically down below. So if I say ls-a, uh, that says do not ignore entries starting with a dot. In Unix, if you start the name of a file or a directory with dot, it's a so-called hidden file, right? Um, uh, L stands for long listing. So if we look down here, uh, there's uh, for the L, uh, H-I-J, the alphabetized L, use a long listing format. And that's where it'll show you or display all the full information uh, associated with a file. It'll tell you the permissions, who owns the file, and so forth. So to get out of the man pages, you just type Q for quit. And you notice we go back to the command prompt. And this command prompt, you notice the cursor is blinking. It's waiting for you to give it a command, right? As we said before, an operating system uh, is just sitting there waiting for something to do. Uh, if it has nothing to do, uh, then it won't uh, uh, run anything, won't do anything. Now, certainly, uh, because this is a graphical uh, user interface, of course, there are processes that are running that are redrawing uh, these icons uh, that are updating the time here. Uh, that's in this particular case, it's uh, looking at the network, it's uh, checking the battery status, and so forth. So while you know this thing is waiting for uh, user program input, there are other uh, processes that are in fact running all the time. Um, one interesting one, so if I say clear, uh, is uh, PS show me uh, process listing. So if I said man PS, show me the list of all the processes uh, that are running on the system. Quit. So if I do that, uh, you'll see that there are in fact quite a few processes. PS, enter. Um, well, there aren't that many. Um, PS-EF, right? Show me everything. Uh, there are quite a few processes. Some associated, LP stands for line printer. So there are a bunch of printer processes that are listening. Uh, root are processes associated uh, with uh, the operating system services and OSC that's the user account for operating system concepts that's what I logged in as so there's one process uh, that is owned uh, by the user account that logged into this virtualized instance okay uh, any questions about this no? all right so let's kind of look around here uh, and see what we have so if I LS uh, I have a bunch of things LS dash L create a long listing and you'll see uh, there are a bunch of directories. So I created one called Gary Holness, uh, but there are the usual directories that are pre-made when you set up the account. Uh, one is called desktop, one is called documents, and it's similar to most other operating systems. Uh, the desktop is just the directory associated with things that you drag and drop and show on this graphical background, right? All it is is just a directory. Uh, that's a type of file system object. Uh, so let's go inside of this Gary Holness directory. And this is just something that I created. And you notice here, the command prompt changed, right? Uh, it gives you OSC at Ubuntu, right? So which account uh, is logged into the system uh, entering these commands. But it also displays um, my, my uh, directory name, Gary Holness, right? Now you notice it's preceded, and this is more of a Unix-ism, uh, it's preceded by this uh, tilde, right? Tilde is shorthand uh, for the home directory. When you first log in, uh, every account uh, is brought to the home directory, which is the starting uh, space or starting place for local storage associated uh, with your account. So let me clear that, clear the terminal itself, and it goes back up. And let me type uh, PWD. So if I say man, just to show, get into the habit of asking the manual pages what things do, PWD stands for present working directory. It's how you show or print the name of a directory listing. My friend. So uh, if we type PWD, uh, we can see uh, the directory structure, home, OSC, all right, so that's the home directory for operating system concepts, and then Gary Holness is the directory that I'm currently in. If I cd space dot dot, that means go back up one directory. So you see what happens here. I'm back in the home directory. If I type PWD, present working directory again, I'm in home OSC. So I could have a whole bunch of directories, Gary Holness, and let's say mkdir, make directory, and call it 
directory one, right? And let me change directory CD to directory one, right? You'll notice here I'm inside directory one. I can create another one, MK directory, directory DIR2. If I type CD, change directory to DIR2, right? You'll notice my command prompt is telling me uh, that I'm inside the second directory. If I were to type um, print working directory or present working directory, you'll see that's my directory structure. So CD dot dot is how you go up one directory and CD with the name of the directory DIR2 is how you go down one directory. And so if you're used to using something like Windows or a graphical operating system, a directory is the same as a folder, right? It's exact same thing, only folder is a graphical construct, but directory on your file system is what it physically is, even on a system where you're using uh, folders in a navigation uh, uh, program. So if I were to bring up uh, this file cabinet, files uh, application, it's just a graphical uh, way of doing uh, through the interface the same thing that I'm doing now uh, with a directory. And I don't know why this isn't running. It should be running. Maybe it's just slow. Okay. All right. So um, it would behoove you uh, to, you know, tinker, have fun with it, uh, try it out. Uh, that's how you get used to it. Do something in it, uh, and uh, it'll get a lot uh, more easy. All right. Any questions about this? Make sense? All right. So uh, let's uh, go back up and go inside this Gary Holness uh, directory, which is uh, what I wanted to uh, to really show for the C programming part. And so um, in C. Uh, it's not like Python, uh, and it's not like Java. C is a so-called uh, compiled language. And with a compiled language, unlike something like Python, since most of you have used Python, in Python, it's an interpreted language. You have this process called the interpreter, and this interpreter uh, can be run interactively. So line by line, you enter in a Python command, and it gives you back the result. Or it can be done as a full-blown program, where you edit a .py file, Python program, a .py file, uh, and then when you run it from the command line, you're typing the command Python and then the name of your Py file. And when you do that, that Python command, uh, that's running the interpreter that then reads the text of this Python Py file, and then it reads it line by line and, Im and implements or follows uh, the syntax or behavior uh, of what has been written in this Py file. With a compiled language, it's a little bit different. In a compiled language, you have a program uh, called a compiler. And this compiler, you can think of as a translator. Uh, it consumes or parses uh, your C file in a compiled language, whether it's C, C++, or what have you. Uh, and it spits out machine code. Machine code uh, are those sequences of ones and zeros uh, that mean something to the processor uh, uh, that is the target of your program. Right? Uh, so when you compile things, it's very specific to a certain processor. Now, Intel makes processors, Motorola makes processors, Texas Instruments makes processors. There are all sorts of processors out there. And when you compile something, you have to compile it or target it, as it's called, for a specific processor, because each processor has a different understanding of uh, what's called the, the, the instruction set. The instruction set is a particular pattern of ones and zeros uh, that get the processor to do things. So when you're actually running a program, all your CPU is doing is it's loading the next instruction, right? If it's a 64-bit architecture, it'll load 64 bits at a time and then do what's called the instruction decode, right? Uh, and gets that from the instruction cache, and then that instruction decode um, gets it to do something. And that do something might be to set up an addition, to set up a division, an exponentiation, do a comparison, uh, and so forth, okay? Uh, so in a compiled language, you have this compiler, and one of the compilers is the C compiler, and it takes your C program, which is just a text file, and it uh, chops it up or parses it um, and spits out machine code. Okay? Uh, so we're going to take a look at a very simple C program. And here I have a very simple one called Hello World with a capital W dot C. Now, the fact that there's a dot C on the end, uh, that should kind of give you a clue that says, ah, I know it's a text file, but the text in it obeys or should obey the rules of C. Likewise, if you have a Python file, it would be called hello world.py, and then you open it up and you see valid Python uh, .java or what have you. So I'm going to run, uh, there's a, an editor called vi. Um, you can use the text editor. It's called gedit, uh, gedit. 
Uh, that's the graphical editor uh, on Ubuntu, uh, kind of like Microsoft, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, what's Microsoft basic editor called? Um, I forgot. What's it called? Pardon? No? Notepad, notepad. All right. When I don't have both ears, it sounds a little different. I can't hear. All right, thank you. All right, notepad. It's like a notepad for for Unix, right? Um, so, but I'm going to use something called VI because that's what I know. And um, you know, the learning curve is a little bit higher, but once you know it, it's uh, very easy to use and it's everywhere. So, I just want to show you what this hello world, hello world. Dot C looks like. So. There are a bunch of things that you'll notice immediately. Um, this is a so-called block-structured language, right? C is. Uh, Python is and Java is. And a block is nothing more than a unit consisting of or containing uh, a number of instructions. Uh, in C, you denote your blocks with an opening and a closing so-called delimiter. A delimiter separates the beginning of a block from the end of a block. Uh, in C, the opening delimiter for a block is open curly brace, and the closing delimiter is closed curly brace. So you see here, this is a function, and it just happens to be called main, and it starts here at the opening curly brace, and it ends there at the closing curly brace. Now, of course, if you're used to something like Python, you don't have these. What you use is indentation. So imagine if I didn't have the open curly brace here, uh, and I didn't have the closed curly brace, you'll note that these were indented, and Python uses levels of indentation. Everything indented flush to the same margin uh, is going to be assumed to be within a block. So um, in C, it's very explicit. It says, you have to tell me where that block begins and ends with the opening curly brace and the closing curly brace. The good news about that uh, is that these don't have to be on different lines. Every piece of text you see here can be all on one line. It would make it difficult for us to see it and uh, make uh, or identify the different parts of it, but the compiler will merrily go along, no problem, right? Uh, that's just here, this indentation and uh, this white space, meaning these blank lines. Uh, that's just here for our benefit because it looks nice, but C, the compiler doesn't care, right? Because everything is explicitly delimited. Now, in particular, another thing that you'll notice, this is a so-called strongly typed language, right? Um, Python is a loosely typed or so-called late binding language. In Python, let's say you have a variable called a, right? And you said a equals one, right? And that's it. Now, when it parses or sees that a equals one or chops it up, it sees the assignment equals, okay, I'm gonna create a variable called a, I'm gonna put a value, associated value with it. And then once it sees the one, it says, ah, this is an integer. If you said 1.1, it's, ah, that's a real number. And if you said equals, open quote, hello, close quote, is it, ah, this is a string. Now, C does not do that. In C, you have to explicitly uh, do what's called declare the types of your variables. You have to say, this is a particular kind of variable. So one of the things you'll notice here, you'll see these keywords like int. Int stands for integer. There's another keyword called float that stands for floating point. And there's another one called double. Double means double precision uh, real value. Right? And the precision means how many words, if you're going to have one word or two words, in IEEE floating point representation. Right? Uh, so you have to be explicit in C at the time when you compile things, explicit in specifying the type of your variable. Right? And there's another one called char. Right? C-H-A-R. That is a, a character, like an ASCII character. It can be numeric. It can be ASCII. It can be a special. Um, OK, so one of the things you'll notice here, char, uh, is an ASCII, uh, is a single character, and you have to in C uh, specify all of your types, right? Uh, you must. Now, the thing about C that is different from things like Java and other, and Python, is that C lets you do weird things, because the assumption is C is that if you're doing something that's not standard, you must have a reason to do that, so it lets you. And so, you know, that famous saying, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, C definitely embodies uh, that, that saying. Uh, so if you have, for example, this type, uh, this star, um, and we'll talk about this next time, uh, implies uh, that this is a pointer, right? And pointer is how you deal with memory in C, right? We'll talk about that in great detail uh, next time, next meeting on Thursday. But 
when you specify a type, all right, now this is a character, star means this is a pointer to that character. That means that whatever value this variable holds, it's going to be considered an address. So it's going to contain a number, that variable, and that number is going to be treated like an address or memory location where you can find a particular type of information. So in this case, char star means that you're going to assume this variable contains a memory address, or so it's a pointer, to data in memory that's going to have characters. Now, what this will allow you to do is let's say you have a piece of memory, and that piece of memory stores uh, integers, right? Well, what it's going to do, it's going to interpret them to the best of its ability to look like characters, right? And you say, gosh, well, that doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. But you can do that in C, okay? All right. So one of the things you'll see here, this is a function, and this function is called main. And in C, main serves a special role. Uh, that is the entry point for what's called the C program loader, called CRT0.ASM, ASM. It's an assembly program. And every time you run a program, it has to start running from someplace. In Python, you have a main uh, function, right? Uh, in just about every language in Java, you have a main method uh, in a class when you're going to run your program, public static void main, right? Uh, similarly, in C, you have a main routine. And this is the entry point or the first place that your program goes to run. Uh, and everything derives from main, right? So your C program, in order to run, has to have a main function. Now that main function has two parameters. One's called argc, that's called the argument count. And so a lot of times in Unix, uh, when you run a command on the command line, you can specify options for it. And these options control things like, don't just do a directory, do the long listing. Well, argc uh, is an integer, right, int argc, and it's a parameter that main is called with, right, uh, by your system. And this has the count of the number of arguments or options specified on the command line. Now, char star star argv, that says it's a pointer to a pointer to character. Anything that's char star uh, or pointer to character, char with a single star or asterisk, um, is, can, be, can be considered as uh, a string, a string of characters, right, a character array as it's called. So what this says, it's a set of character arrays. So this is the actual text uh, that's specified on the command line. So any program in C running on Unix, when you have your main entry point or your main function, you have to have these two uh, parameters because it's going to call your program, the operating system will, uh, when it runs with these two. Now, if argc can certainly be zero, um, and that is the case if you don't have any arguments you specify, and then char star star argv in that case uh, will be null which is like saying the nothing character, okay? All right, uh, so another thing, questions about that? Questions? Okay. Another thing you'll see is up top here, I have this number sign include, right? Uh, this is a so-called preprocessor directive, and you'll notice I have this hash mark, right, this number sign. Now, in some languages, number sign means this is a comment, in C, it means it's a so-called preprocessor directive. Now, what a preprocessor directive is in C, it has to do with the compiler. Um, the compiler, yes, it takes this C program and it translates it into machine code. But one of the things it does is it can substitute things based on what's called the C preprocessor. So the C preprocessor is the first step of compiling. Uh, and what it does is it reads all these commands of the sort number sign include, number sign some command, and there are uh, standard C preprocessor directives. Uh, for example, if I wanted to uh, type a message, and let's say I was tired of, um, you know, typing hello world or type some character, I could say number sign define uh, the word my message, and this is in all caps, I did that on purpose, as uh, some text, right? So what that's going to do in this particular case, um, the... Uh, Let's see, let me go up. Escape. All right, what that's gonna do, this number sign here, um, number sign include in particular says, there are system libraries or system calls. These are functions, libraries of functions made available by the operating system uh, that I can use uh, as part of the environment offered to my program by the operating system. And so, you need to know what all those functions are. In the same way that we have this uh, declaration of a function, 
main returns an integer and it has two parameters one's an integer and the other is char star star right well you need to know all the definitions of these system calls so that your uh, program can make use of the services made available by the operating system well one of the ways you do that or the way you do that is using this number sign include and in this uh, angle brackets here stdio standard io that's one of the system library so-called headers and a header is just a text file um, that contains a list of function declarations that you might have available to you. Now this particular header file, standard io.h, is part of the operating system, and this is that interface, if you will, uh, between the system services for input-output uh, between any program uh, and the operating system. Okay? So number sign include standard io, it makes available this printf function. You'll notice here, nowhere in this program do I define printf, right? Um, I just use it, just call it. Well, that's because inside of standard io.h, which is inside or made available by the operating system, there's a definition of what this printf is, and then there's a library that's going to get um, combined with my program to make the full executable. And we'll talk about that next time as well. So this other number sign preprocessor directive, number sign define, what that does, it's a substitution. Sometimes it's called a macro, right? And what it says, when I say number sign define, I have some variable or text, in this case, my message, and I put that in all caps um, on purpose. That's because when I use it, I want to visually know there's something different about this particular thing. Now, the style is in C programming that every time you have a preprocessor macro, that you're going to use all caps for the name, right? And so what it does, literally, number sign define, it says, okay, anywhere in my program, I see the text, my message, in all caps with the underscore, I'm going to substitute that some text. Uh, and I can use that with numbers, I can use uh, text, I can use whatever. So now, if I said printf, printf, my message, oops, my message, bless you, I'm now printing, it's, it will substitute um, open quote, some text, close quote, wherever that occurrence of my message is, okay? And that does two things, it makes your code a little bit more readable, but let's say, you know, you're implementing a product or project um, or some program where you want to so-called localize it, you want to have it available, all these messages it outputs in different languages, right? You would just have all of the text of your program separate from the actual code itself, and then when you want to have it in a different language, you just go and you change what that text is to be in the target language for that market. Now, current practices, and I'll get to your question in just a second, uh, current practices, you have it in a separate file called a resource file, um, but you can use preprocessor directives to use uh, to do that for simple programs quite easily. A question. A global variable for oh for some text. Oh, because I just wanted to just um, to to demonstrate using preprocessor. I could easily have done a global variable. Yes. Um, and so you know, there's this they kind of like the style, right? Um, some people and I, you know, uh, am one of them prefer to have text messages as preprocessor commands, whereas with variables, there's nothing wrong with using a variable. Um, if it's a global variable, it works, but some would argue, if you're in a small environment, if you declare a global variable, you're adding to the symbol table and you're adding to um, the number amount of space allocated. So um, I came at computer science, oh, undergrad, I didn't do computer science. I came at it as electrical engineer. Uh, looking at computer engineering and embedded systems and stuff like that. And so if you're really concerned in small environments, um, the preprocessor, that's free, right? Well, quote unquote free. But the global variable, you're still going to add to the allocation that happens and you're going to add to something called the symbol table. The symbol table is a list of all the variables that are associated because they have to go someplace, right? Uh, and so whether you choose variables or choose preprocessors, it's really just a matter of style. Uh, I, for one, am honest enough to admit the difference between opinion and fact. And so, you know, depending on the environment, the application, and more so taste, uh, you might do one versus the other. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So let's take a look at this, and let's actually do the compilation. But <clears throat> 
So write and quit. So now I wrote this. And if I want to look at it from the command line, cat means concatenate. It means show me all the text. Hello world.c. It'll just take the contents of this file and show it to me on the screen. Now, the compiler is called the GNU GNU Compiler Collection, or GCC, right? GCC is the name of the compiler. Uh, and if I give it uh, the name dash C, that's an option, right? Uh, and that dash C says, I'm going to compile it only, right? Uh, so say gcc.c, all right, I'm going to compile only, um, hello world.c. So that says run the compiler, and the compiler's name is gcc. Uh, this dash C says I want you to compile it, translate it into um, uh, object code or binary, and the thing you're going to compile is called hello world.c. So if I do that, I'll notice that there's a file that gets created called hello world.o, right? That's the object file, right? But that object file isn't done yet. I have to take that object file and remember that called printf. Printf does not exist in my program hello world.c. This is what hello world.c looks like to jar your memory. So the definition of main, it's going to call, call a function twice called printf. That printf has to come from someplace. Well, I just got done saying standard IO, stdio.h, it has the definition. Now, associated with that is so-called so system library, right? And the system library is a piece of code in the operating system that actually has the implementation of what that print function is. It includes a trap, right? Uh, it's a system call. All right, so the second part of this process, we first have the compile that says translate this particular program uh, into object code, but it's missing the definition of printf. Now, the second step is so-called linking, right? And the linker is that program that will take the objects, um, both those that are from the operating system that contain the implementation of those functions, as well as those from your program, it'll glue them together into an executable, right? And so how you run the linker portion, gcc-o, right? The result is going to be called hello world. That's the executable. And the object I want to link together with the system object, so GCC knows where to get the operating systems uh, side of it, where printf is implemented. And uh, hello world.o. So it says GCC O, link together all the system libraries referred to. Um, I want the result to be called hello world, and that's the executable. And the object that I want you to paste into the system libraries is called hello world.o, which is what I just created. Okay? So if I do that, I hit enter, it comes back pretty quickly. And you'll see, if I do a long listing, hello world, that's green here, highlighted. And so one of the things the uh, command line interface does on these graphical systems, it'll paint things in different colors to, to connote different things. In this case, green means executable. Okay. Any questions about this? All right, uh, so when I run hello world, I'm gonna say current directory, that's dot, hello world, right? And I have to get the spelling right. I hit enter and I'll see hello world and some text. Now you notice some text is right there on the line, right? It looks kind of weird. I need to have a carriage return. So let me add that carriage return. So let me bring back up my uh, message and my message here, it doesn't have that backslash n. Backslash n is uh, carriage return, and sometimes on some platforms you have to have what's called carriage return line feed. That's an artifact of when things use teletypes, right? Carriage return uh, means um, take the print head and return it to the left-hand side uh, of, the, of the paper. Line feed means advance the paper. And so that terminology has stuck uh, in uh, computers. Okay, so let me save that. And let me now run it again. So I'm going to recompile it, retranslate it, because I changed the program. And um, I'll talk about a little bit about what I'm doing when I hit the up arrow. Um, so let me compile it. And then let me link it. And let me rerun it. And we'll see it now prints the carriage return line feed on each line. So I get the hello world. 
uh, and some text, which is what I added uh, through the preprocessor. Now you might be wondering, well, well, how am I doing that on the keyboard, right? There's something in, um, in Unix command line interfaces called the history buffer, right? So if you type history, it remembers all the commands that you did from the first time when you logged in, and it numbers them. So if I said PWD, present working directory, and typed history again, it says PWD in history, right? History was the last thing I did. PWD was right before that. Now, when I hit the up arrow at the command line interface, it scrolls backwards in time to all the commands that I did. It's a really nice, uh, quick uh, way to work using what's in your history buffer. Uh, and then now, when I scroll up using up arrow through that history buffer, um, I can just hit enter if I see a command that I used before that I like and I want to run it again. Right? So that makes it really easy, and that's called the history buffer. Another thing you can do with your history buffer is do a query. Right? So let's say GCC. If I say exclamation, exclamation is also known as bang. Right? It's like something happened. That's a poor choice of example. Anyways, uh, it is called bang. Um, and if I say exclamation and the partial spelling of a command, GCC, it's going to go back through the history buffer, back in time, and the first instance it finds of something that contains GCC, it's going to play that automatically. So here I have my history buffer is GCC dash O hello world, hello world dot O. So it, it replays that. So a lot of times when you're editing and compiling and linking and re editing, you're going to repeat a handful of commands over and over again. Uh, and so this history buffer is really useful to kind of save you from all of the typing. Okay? There's nothing wrong with doing it out you know, each time, no problem with that. But, you know, if it can save you keystrokes and make you more productive, uh, that's fine too. Now, certainly, there are a lot of IDEs available uh, for Linux uh, for free. Uh, NetBeans is one of them. And you can actually, it's no, nothing wrong with developing on Linux uh, using NetBeans to do C development. And if that is useful to you because of the sophisticated debugger, uh, then by all means do that. But one of the things that you can do is automate all of this instead of having to type those commands again. And there's something called a make file. And let me bring up that make file. Now this make file um, is a way, um, uh, e edit. okay. This make file is a way of saving you from all of these keystrokes uh, and all of this constant commands by specifying how these different parts of the compilation process are related to one another. Now, a make file has the following format. You'll see uh, what's called a target, right? And that's just a name here on the left-hand side of a colon. And then you'll see uh, something called a dependency, and that's what's on the right-hand side of this colon. Now, a dependency says this is what it needs to look at, what this target depends on. So in this case, the default rule Right? If you just type a certain command called make, and I'll talk about that in a second, if you don't type anything, the default dependency is hello world, which just happens to be the name of... So this says that this default rule will depend on hello world. Right? So that's the default if I do nothing. And this hello world is a target, right? and it depends on hello world.o. That means in order to create hello world target, you have to have available hello world object. All right, so we have this thing is called targets, the thing on the left-hand side of the colon, and dependencies, the thing on the right-hand side of the colon. Now below the target and dependency spec is a command, and that's what is executed should the dependency have a newer date than the target. So what does this say? It says hello world.o, the object file, depends on hello world.c. So if the hello world.c has a date associated or time that's newer than hello world.o, well, that means that I've edited the C file and saved it. Because when I save it, it now has a new timestamp, right? So what is it going to do? If hello world is newer than hello world.o, if hello world.c is newer than hello world.o, it's going to call GCC compile hello world.c, right? So you string together these types of rules, and that allows you to type a single command called the make uh, system, right? Uh, there's a make command, and that allows you to very easily or more easily uh, 
write software, build software, compile it and link it uh, without having to type all these commands over and over again. And then there's a rule or target called clean and that removes all of your object files. So maybe you want to remove it. And there's another one called install that I won't talk about. So let me save this and let's say, let's run make clean and make is uh, a utility. And when you run make, make is gonna look for a file in the current directory called make file make file with a capital M. So if I run make clean, it's going to say, okay, make the target called clean and clean, you'll notice it said remove all of the .o files, star.o, right? So now if I type make again, that's the default rule it'll use. And you'll notice it typed GCC compile hello world and link to get hello world executable. Now what it's doing there, cat make file is when I type make clean, it executed the clean target, which says remove all the objects. When I then type make, it executed the default rule, which says I depend on hello world. Hello world, it went down here, it says, oh, I depend on hello world.o. It's not there because it was removed. I depend on hello world.c. Let me compile. And then once it could reduce hello world.o, it said, okay, hello world.o is there. It's now newer. Let me do the link step. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? Now, many IDEs like NetBeans, you can actually have it generate the make file for you. Um, there are other more sophisticated things like Maven and stuff like that, but that's not the point of this class. That's a software engineering class, all right? Um, so in short, C is a block structured language. It has delimiters and it's a so-called strongly type language uh, where you uh, explicitly define your types uh, and you can use make files to kind of glue this together. You need the compiler. Uh, in two steps, there's the compilation, the translation of your C program uh, to object code, uh, and then there's the linking, which is the pasting together of your object with the system libraries uh, for the system calls that it, that it needs uh, to, to make use of OS services. Okay, so I'm going to stop there.